I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners for January 7, 2020. I invite you to stand if you like as uh, Commissioner Nash offers the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would with me, please join me in praying to the God of your choice or none at all. Dear God, today may we be open to others' ideas and beliefs, respectful of our differences but not threatened by them. May we grow an understanding of our own motives, knowing that people often act out of their own fears. May we be a force for replacing fear with insight, helping us all to be more patient and kind as we talk. Strength, real strength can always find compromise. Working together, may we find common ground, enabling us to move forward with a shared purpose. May we see what is truly important and what unites us rather than divides us. Amen. Please face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Follow roll. Commissioner Denning. Here. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Perrigan. Here. Commissioner Beasley Brown. Here. Mayor Wilkerson. Here. Any awards or recognitions this evening? I do not, Mayor. Anyone from the commission? Have any comments tonight? I just want to uh, comment on the fact that there is no such ordinance uh, that's floating around about no flip flops uh, worn <laughs> by males over 18 years old. That is totally false and fake, so uh, disregard. Uh. So. No death penalty. That, that was, no that no was, death penalty for the fourth. That offense. was sent to me. Is it legit? <laughs> the approval of minutes from our regular meeting on December seventeenth, two thousand nineteen. Uh, Move. Second. Motion by Nash. Second by Beasley <laughs> Brown. And any additions, deletions, or corrections? Please call the roll. Denning. Yes. Nash. Yes. Perrigan. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order two thousand twenty number one. Municipal order approving the promotions of John Balance, Chris Durbin, and Ron Renner to the position of company commander, and Chad Ennis and Esmir Farizovich and Chase McKee to the position of fire apparatus operator in the fire department. A move. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Perrigan. Mr. Oswald. Due to some uh, transfers and demotions and retirements in the fire department, we have some opportunity for promotion tonight to uh, company commanders and fire apparatus operators. I'd like to ask Deputy Chief Gillum to come forward and present his recommendations. Mayor and Commissioners, it's a pleasure to be here this evening to present recommendations for promotion for six positions uh, which have been created by recent retirements in the fire division. Uh, promotional testings for each of these positions was completed in the fall of 2019. Uh, five members competed for testing process for uh, company commander and 18 members uh, for fire apparatus operator. Promotional testing for these positions consisted of a written exam and, ex and assessments of uh, members' performances while con uh, conducting multiple tasks related to the positions that they are pursuing. As you know, the fire department works diligently to, uh, to develop our members and prepare them for the next level of their career. The members I am recommending for promotion have pursued opportunities, attended training, and completed professional development courses in order to be presented here tonight. They've obtained numerous certifications and credentials to validate their time and effort. They possess the, the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities to advance within the Bowling Green Fire Department. With that, I'm, I am pleased to recommend the following members for company commander. Ron Renner. Ron, can I get you to stay? Tonight, Ron, Ron is accompanied by his wife, Paula, and his kids, Brody, Bree, and Addie. John Balance. Tonight, John's accompanied by his wife, Katie, his kids, Ryan, Reagan, and John Reed. And then Chris Durbin. Oh, there you are. Chris Durbin is accompanied tonight by his wife, uh, Laura, and then his girls, Piper and Paisley. Thank you. You guys can be seated. With these promotions, uh, they will create openings for fire apparatus operator, and I'm pleased to recommend the following firefighters. Chad Ennis. Tonight, Chad's accompanied by his wife, Jenny, and his kids, Addison and Tucker. Chase McKee. 
Chase is accompanied by his wife, Katie, and his kids, Lily and Callan. And then Esmer Ferrazovic. Esmer is accompanied by his uh, wife tonight, uh, Mirella. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. During their careers, each of these members have been solid performers to our organization. They have invested in their future and, and prepared to serve the citizens of Bowling Green in their new capacity. With that, it is my pleasure to recommend each of them for promotion, and I'd be happy to enter uh, entertain any questions you may have. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Congratulations, guys. <laughs> ben. <laughs> All right, Municipal Order two, uh, 2020, number two. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Daniel Brown to the position of police officer in the police department. So moved. Second. Okay. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. Mr. Meisel. We are currently uh, in search uh, for eight police officers. Uh, we're short by eight due to some, uh, some leaves, uh, transfers out. Uh, but we have an opportunity here to hire a certified officer, uh, which is which is rare when one shows up on your front doorsteps. Uh, it's it's a great opportunity. Uh, Mr. Daniel Brown is uh, currently a police officer at WKU. Has served there for two years. Also served some time, three years at KSP. Uh, he's also uh, a veteran from the Marines. Uh, served for six years uh, for our country, and uh, we are recommend, recommending him to be appointed as police officer, officer tonight. Uh, Aaron Holsey is it here as, as well as um, Deputy Chief Bowles to answer any questions you might have. Is Mr. Brown here? He could not make it, sorry. Any comments? Probably working. Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning. Yes. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. And congratulations, Mr. Brown. Look forward to his work too. <laughs> Municipal Order 2020, number three. Municipal Order approving amendments to the promotional procedures <clears throat> for police chief and fire chief. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen. Second by Beasley Brown. Mr. Meisel. Before you know it, we have some proposed uh, revisions to our promotional procedures for police and fire chief uh, testing and promotions. I'd like to ask Aaron Holsey, our HR director, to come up and uh, answer your questions and get, maybe give you a brief overview of what the changes are. Aaron. Welcome. Good afternoon. I was just rifling through some of um, Mike Rob's old documents and I thought that this might be a procedure that we should take a look at this year and so I decided to go ahead and talk to Jeff about making some updates to it. Um, I, I hopefully in your binders are attached kind of a, a dirty version with all of the edits that you can see and a cleaner version that's a little bit um, easier to read. And really the only um, change that I would draw your attention to is eligibility. Um, this is a procedure that was created quite a long time ago when the organization of these two departments were quite different. And right now, with the support of the city manager, with the police chief, and with the fire chief, we thought it most appropriate to take out uh, the positions of captain and company commander to be eligible to test for promotion to chief. Uh, we right now in uh, police and fire both have two deputy chief positions and uh, four assistant chief within the police department, five within the fire department. We think that there are ample candidates within those positions, and if there are not, we might be in a position to um, have to search outside the city. So that's the main change, um, I think, that you'll see 
the change to the assessment centers isn't really a change in the assessment centers. It's really just describing how we actually do it a little bit better and um, some other um, additional selection criteria that has also been used in the past but wasn't actually listed in here. So just some kind of updating the language and whatnot. Comments or questions? Thank you, Ms. Aaron. Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2020, number four. Municipal Order approving amendments to the City of Bowling Green financial policies and procedures. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Mr. Meisel. During the 2019 General Assembly, there was a House Bill uh, 69 that, that was passed that gave uh, local governments like us more options on our investments. Uh, we've been kind of tied down on what we can do with investments. Uh, this kind of opens up some things for us. And uh, Katie has worked on some amendments to our uh, financial policies and procedures. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Katie to answer questions and also give you an, a brief overview of what uh, changes are with involving House Bill 69. Katie. Um. Your manager mentioned most of these changes are part of a cleanup to match what the legislation provides. Um, they expanded the ability for local governments to um, be able to invest in equities and commercial, or I'm sorry, corporate bonds, so we've added that language. There were a couple other options that were in state statute we didn't previously have in our policies that we've also decided that we could add um, just to expand the toolbox, not that we would necessarily take advantage of them right now. Uh, but down the, down the road and in the future, if we decided it was prudent, we would do that. Um, and there was one other change uh, dealing with uh, certificates of deposit. We have to um, now utilize a Kentucky-based um, banking institution or investment firm that holds the certificate. We can no longer have CDs that are outside of or held outside of the state of Kentucky. So that's a particular change that was added. So we had to update our language for that as well. Questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2020, number five. Municipal order approving and authorizing the mayor to execute a lease agreement with SK Power Sports Promotions, LLC, for a portion of Glen Lily Landfill property. So moved. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. Mr. Meisel. Just a brief uh, chronological history. Uh, a few weeks ago, I got a call from uh, Mr. Josiah Head, who is with us tonight with SK Power Sports. Uh, they are working on an event uh, hoping to bring it to Bowling Green, the Grand National Cross Country event, motorsports. And they were looking for a location and they thought they had some property uh, locked down uh, for this event and that kind of fell through. And so they started looking at our landfill property on Glen Lily Road and uh, caught some interest on that. We have 266 acres out there of which roughly 30 acres or so is our landfill. And so uh, we got to talking uh, more involved. Also Matt Powell, of course, uh, for on all the technical questions of the landfill. Uh, Gene has helped me work on this as well as uh, Greg Meredith and Dave Weisbrot. We have put together a lease agreement uh, to uh, do this event in May two days in May, May 16th and 17th, uh, for them to lease the property and, and use it for this event uh, in the amount of $3,000 with, with a, in addition a $1,000 bond to cover any uh, damages or, or, or restoration that's needed. Uh, SK, SK has, a, an, has an agreement with GNCC as well and uh, Mr. Head can, can give you details of that agreement, but we feel like we have locked down uh, most of the um, things we need to uh, involving this property and the use of it in, the, in this agreement, as well as the insurance coverage. Uh, every participant, every rider that walks through the gates uh, of this event will be signing a waiver of release of liability and uh, in your packets, you do have a two-page letter from Mr. Head explaining and, and describing the event. 
but uh, I'd be willing to turn the mic over to Mr. Head if he wants to come up and kind of give you a brief overview of what all this event this event entails and can answer your questions. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name is Cy Head, also known as Josiah Head. Uh, I've been an ATV racer my entire life. I'm an enthusiast. I'm a local business owner in Bowling Green and out of Russellville. Uh, the GNCC, the Grand National Cross Country Series, is the most premier off-road racing series, mostly in the world to me, but for sure in the, in the United States. So what we did is my partner and I, Cash Moore, I'm speaking on his behalf. He is actually away on a working contract right now. What we did was, as racers, we saw the need for there to be a power sports motive in Bowling Green. We know that Bowling Green has a strong motorsports presence because we have Beach Bend, we have the Corvette track that is now out there. Of course, we have the Corvette Museum, but power sports in particular pertain to ATVs, motorcycles, dirt bikes, UTVs, things of that nature. Obviously, the first thing that we wanted to make sure we were good on was the insurance and liability coverage. Well, when we approached GNCC, there were a lot of series that we could have went to beforehand. We decided to go to GNCC first because Bowling Green can house the name GNCC Grand National Cross Country. They are the largest, they are the most effective, they bring the most revenue to an area. Um, on, a, on an estimation, just so, you, so we all understand, on an estimation, there should be about a three to four million dollar increase in the economy in one weekend from the event. It's just a Saturday and Sunday event. Uh, we had them agreed to come. Uh, all liability will be covered by NG and CC. Anything that we need to cover additionally, we have already discussed yesterday with uh, Jeff and other members, that we will cover that as well. But any questions that you all may have, I can answer anything you need. Is he going to ask? Oh, well, a minute. Let's, let's get our questions first, and then we'll talk to him. Yeah, I've got two or three. Okay. Uh, one in particular, and the lady who's seated here on the front row was talking with uh, us out in the hallway, and I certainly take interest in this. What are you doing as far as, far as your traffic, ingress and egress, and who's going to be responsible? Have you contacted uh, uh, First of all, I guess I need to ask, who patrols that area? Is it our city policeman or KSB is here? This location is on Glen Lily Road, so everyone's on the same page. Uh, as far as ingress and egress goes, to answer your question, uh, the GNCC has a 50 to 70 member crew. Uh, what we are looking at, because the entrance of the property is so well created for what we're wanting to do, there's actually a little triangle out in front of the property for paved roadway. So what we will do is upon GNCC deciding which way to come in, we will actually have one road in and one road out. Everybody that will be coming to the event will be notified by email, be notified by the GNCC page, through anything, any means necessary, to where, for example, this is not set in stone, but if you were to come north on Glen Lily, that would be the entrance. And when we wanted to leave, we would send everybody east, which is, I think it's Price's Chapel Road. Am I correct there? So there's a couple different ways we can do it, but GNCC will cover that. That is in our contract with them. Of course, we're working alongside with Jeff right now to make sure that all these things are discussed before everything is signed and put pen to paper. But everything, will, we will make sure that it will be taken care of. And of course, we want to make sure that whatever police and patrolling units we can get and desi decide to be out there, we want their help as well. Ron. Hi, Ron. Hello. Commissioners, Ron Bunch, Bone Green Area Chamber of Commerce. And Janet's here as well, too, from the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Now, our, our community has done a great job over the years in working with motorsports events, and we host some very large motorsports events. And because of that, we've actually put together a committee between the Chamber, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, law enforcement, public safety, a variety of different entities. And so what the Chamber and the CVB are doing is convening that group and talking about not just this event, but any and all major events coming to the community and where they're being housed so that we can make sure that we're doing adequate preparations far in advance of the activities in addition to what a property owner might do and or a, a promoter might do. So I just wanted to add that other organizational dimension. So we regularly meet with law enforcement, um, the design folks from the city, the county, public works. So there's an ongoing group. We can send you the contacts in it that coordinate these different things that will make sure we're preparing well in advance. Ron, 
will some of the law enforcement people be present on both days or just spot check? How is that going to work? Uh, we haven't had the meeting with the law enforcement yet because I believe this event's in May. But we can get that answer and get it back to the city commission and make sure the city commission is well aware of what the law enforcement, because then we, we have to default on their professional opinion on how best to handle it. I, I have spoken with Chief Hawkins, and Chief, you want to come up, and we, we've decided that it, it is our property. It's not in our jurisdiction, but it is our property, and Doug, you want to take it from, if we get a call, if there was an incident, we would respond. Doug. Yeah. Um, that 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 piece of property is an interesting piece of property because the city owns it but it is not um, annexed into the city and so uh, I asked the question and I think we have all uh, become comfortable with the idea that we understand that the, the sheriff's office is doing traffic direction at the intersections or wherever traffic direction is needed for this event um, but I asked if there was a if there was an incident if there was a fight, if there was uh, somebody's car damage, if there was a car wreck on the property, who's going to deal with those issues? And um, I guess my initial opinion was, and I think it's where we've ultimately landed, was it's our property. It's city-owned property. Um, city police certainly can. That's, that's within, we have countywide jurisdiction just like the, uh, the sheriff's office does, just like Kentucky State Police, we can all do policing countywide. Um, and so we felt like because it was our property and we obviously have some interest in that, um, that we would be first responders but coordinate that with other law enforcement agencies depending on the type of call for service that we might have out there. And so uh, I think my position is, and I don't think we have any problems with responding to individual calls for service on that piece of property during that event. Typically, nobody occupies that property, and so typically this is not an issue we even have to deal with. But because we're talking about, I guess, potentially thousands of people being on this piece of property, look, you put that many people together, there's likely to be a law enforcement-related call for service need out there. And so uh, we're comfortable being the first responder to that piece of property because we own it. But if there is, depending on the nature of that call, we would also then request assistance from any other appropriate agency uh, that might be needed. So that's, I think that's the position we're taking right now. My questions more deal uh, with uh, liability and planning of the event. And uh, the, the calls that I've gotten about this have all been about is this city accepting some liability for people riding uh, in a sport that is not or is more dangerous than, say, swimming. <laughs> and so, pardon me? Or skateboarding. Or skateboarding. <laughs> we found one. Hey, we found one. Uh, so I want to make sure that I understand this and, and that you're on the record, and that is that you are assuming all risks in connection with the operation of the event and you or your by contract with someone else are solely responsible for all accidents or injuries to a person while participating in the event you are responsible the city is not right and if we if the city receives some kind of notice some kind of legal notice you will appear and you will take over that process as it relates to an injury or an accident that happened on the property in particular it may not be myself personally it will be myself partner cash and then on behalf of GNCC as well the Grand National Cross Country Series right and I know the city manager has already mentioned it but every person who participates in this is going to sign a waiver that says they recognize they're participating in a somewhat dangerous sport and they accept all liability to this themselves that would happen while participating sir and actually the way that we're going to coordinate that even more effectively than the rest of the series does is the, the property entrance, I know, you know most of you may not have seen the property yet, but the gravel that aligns the right side of the property, the straight shot, as soon as you pull in, is nearly a quarter mile before it ever even begins to turn. And that is straight gravel. So what we will do is we will line fencing, rope. I say fencing, but I actually mean you know stakes into the ground. Pull rope along the left side so that no vehicle coming in has the opportunity to turn left into the field at all. 
what they will do is they will travel their way a quarter mile. One, that will give us the opportunity to line up as many rigs as you can imagine. But two, what that will do is each individual vehicle will pass someone who is at the very front and is handing out not only a clipboard that says you're responsible for yourself, of course, but two, once every single person signs that, then the people that have come through and decide to race, the people that have come there to race, will also go and check in and register for the race and sign a completely different document stating not only they're responsible for themselves as a spectator, but as for a racer as well. It's many, many pages of documentation. Of course, this is an AMA-sanctioned event, the American uh, Motorcycle Association. So once again, there's not been an issue that I've known of in recent history with GNCC where anyone was hurt and GNCC became liable for that because of the documentation that we have upon entry of the event. Second comment is that, uh, as I understand it, as it stands now, that's also the same weekend that uh, Western Kentucky University is going to have graduation and commencement. So Same. I'm glad to see that that tourism is involved because hotel rooms are going to be at a premium uh, with, with even more people being in town than, than normally would. Sir, and that, and that was upon, just so we're all on the same page, when this was first discussed, the very first meeting that we had, of course we had Miss Janet Henderson in the room on behalf of the CVB, and we had Ron Bunch. Ron and I have been friends for a very long time. But in that discussion, we, of course, were, were making sure, of course, Janet's one initial deal was if we bring this many people into Bowling Green, we want to make sure that the gas stations are aware. We want to make sure there's enough ice. We want to make sure that all the hotels, we've already started blocking rooms for the hotels. So all of those things, once again, we're making sure that we're coordinating this with every entity of the city as much as we possibly can. And with the guidance of Ron, Mr. Ron Bunch, Chamber President, I think we've pretty much covered all of our ground so far. Great. And then lastly, my, mine is just, and I don't even know who to thank, but I like that uh, everybody was willing to work together to see this come to fruition. Uh, I remember a time, uh, at least in my opinion, that we, we said no to a lot of things because they were out of the box or different or we were going to have to do extra work to them. I think the idea that we're trying to find ways to say yes rather than say no is a positive sign for Bowling Green. I agree. I wanted to say thank you to everyone as well, especially Jeff. He has worked very hard in making sure we coordinate this properly. Do we have any other questions? I got a couple. I guess the, the first question comes to mind is we own the property. Can we not annex that into the city? No? Oh. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> sometimes we can get creative with those things, but it would be nice to, for our own property to be within our own community. <laughs> um, you know, that I was going to ask about graduation day too because, I, you know, I, I work at a pretty local hotel it's close to western and you know we're already sold out for graduation it's our it's the way it is but uh but <clears throat> janet are we not a sold out community on graduation day for western kentucky universities pretty much let me, let me clarify one thing as well um, and it's something that we cleared up yesterday in, in our uh, meeting that we had yesterday afternoon but the majority of the people that are going to be coming to these races, they're going to be driving $70,000 vehicles, $150,000 campers. They will pull very gently and slowly onto a campsite as they're worth more than most homes are, and they will stay the night in their camper, in their, in their truck, in their, their RV, whatever it may be. So that alone will take a lot of the heavy load off of the hotels, but that's not saying that most people that aren't racing, they will seek hotels. They will. And we know that, and that's what Janet's already prepared for. So I hope that gives you some type of comfort. Right, right. Well, I, I didn't know how, what, our, what our occupancy rate is in our hotels in Bowling Green. I know Janet would in Bowling Green for our commencement. Another weekend would be great. <laughs> I love that. Selfishly. Jesus is coming, but if he could pick another day, that'd be right. awesome. The right. <laughs> I don't know that I would equate this to the coming of, of No, Christ, I, but, but I, wanted to, I wanted to just make a comment on that, really, is about the timing of it. For us to have GNCC coming to Bowling Green this year is phenomenal. It is a huge lift. We went from not even being on the map at all to having the premier series put us on their dates for 2020. But on that line of thought, you know, we're in the business of growing business, tourism's in the business of booking more hotel rooms. So you know, ideally we would have had a date that we had low vacancy, I mean, you know, low attendance and then we could fill it out. But the reality is, is we're building a, a following for this. So, you know, one, we're very fortunate to have it this year. I just wanted to say that after having talked to the head of GNCC, the 
chamber and CVB working to get that locked down. <laughs> but the vision is for this to grow over time. So once GNCC comes here and has an exceptional time here, staying with chamber partners, eating with chamber partners, doing all those other things, frequenting the CVB membership and the hotels and all the other stuff, we're hoping to bring other events, other series, other things to really build this, much like the CVB has done with motorsports, where you have a variety of different car shows during the year, filling up hotels and eating food and doing, buying gas and doing all the other great things all other times of the year. This is just the first in what we hope to be a series of things that happen here. So I just wanted to add that bigger context to that because I, I thought I had Absolutely. a feel for where your question was coming from. You know, we're working in the business, I understand, and, and part of, you know, I, I trust Janet and the, and the CVB, we work very closely together to know if we have capacity in Bowling Green because part of what creates that, um, that experience here in Bowling Green is being able to stay here in Bowling Green and not have to commute to say Nashville and some of our events they have to because frankly we don't have the capacity so you know hopefully we can get them all here which is okay. what my, my get them all here is. more often get them to stay longer spend more that's money while exactly. they're here that's the plan yeah I, I know this is this is in the ordinance but I want to say this for the population that's out there uh, watching television that don't, don't have the you know that don't read this um, this property will be put back to its original state after you're done with it. Say a little bit about that. So, so the an original, the original intent when we spoke with GNCC is, if we find a property, and we host an event on this property, what happens after the property has been used? Well, the very first thing that they told us, they laughed and they said no issue. And then when we got more specific details, it was in our contract with GNCC. If anything, so say for example, it's May 16th, 17th. Noah's Ark type of flood comes and it just gets Happens. it gets crazy even if and just so we're all clear on the same page we discussed this yesterday we will not be t partaking any motor vehicles on top of the landfill area so landfill area is actually only about 10 percent of the property we're more interested in the woods we're working with the other people that are surrounding the property to obtain more property to use so to give you a general idea when the GNCC comes we will go into an open field section one that was not once used in landfill we will put hay bales up. They'll be wrapped in sponsorship things. They may say fly racing, moose racing, and they will race around them, and then they will dr drop off in the woods. The GNCC uses a small dozer. When I say small, it's very long, it's very heavy, but it's narrow. So at the end of this event, what GNCC will do, at the very worst case, is the property ends up with a five-foot-wide, six-foot-wide walking trail. GNCC will not only go in and take the dozer and, you know, I'm, I'm assuming the way they do it here because I operate machinery sometimes, I'm assuming they will drop the blade and go backwards or they'll use a mulching head on their equipment and they will return the course to the way that it was when they first cut it. They will avoid all major trees. The number one goal is we want to cut a course fast. We don't want to run up on a tree any bigger than this, something else we discussed yesterday. Uh, obviously because one, it's going to take more time. Two, there's no reason to take down trees that don't have to be taken down. The number one goal of a course is tight, technical, imagine if you're playing a video game. That's how it would be. And then of course the fields, they would return those to the way that they were no matter what happens. So this, this event has actually been hosted in Park City, I think three or four years back in 2012 to 2015. That property has since been foreclosed on by the owners of the property, which is why GNCC stopped coming. At that time, of course, we had a lot of national champions from around this area. We have three alone within 15 miles of this location that are three of the most well-known racers in the history of all power sports. It's incredible, and they're right here. We have not had racing because as those three stepped away from racing, had, had whatever going on in their lives, this community no longer had that opportunity. So as Ron spoke on, and I want to elaborate on that, this is the beginning of something much, much larger than just having a GNCC event. Um, to be more specific, once this is done, no matter where we do it, we are going somewhere, and it doesn't matter where, we are going to build what's considered, what Ron would consider the Disneyland of power sports. And the reason we're going to do that is because there's a demand. The reason there's a demand is because there's so many people in this area that have power sport and motorsport vehicles put away in their garage that they put on Facebook Marketplace hoping to sell because they have nowhere to go. So we want to do that. Once again, the original intention was get involved with the city and every entity possible, which started with Ron, then became Janet, and then obviously went to Jeff, and make sure that no matter where we do this, it's done with not only the, the support of the city, but hand in hand with the city so that we don't have to run anything down the road. So does anyone have any other questions? I'll be glad to answer anything you have. 
Uh, so this is a, a great idea. I'm really excited to hear all the partnership that's going on, and I know you all have worked really hard and to solve any problems that come have come up. Um, a couple questions I have had, um, and just want to reiter reiterate here, are one is the noise factor. Can you talk a little bit about the suppression that you all have yes. for the motorsport? So, so the easy way to explain this is this. The average lawnmower is around 91 to 93 decibels. The average concert is around 110 to 120 decibels. I'm an audio specialist, so I, I am qualified to speak on this subject. Uh, with your average lawnmower, you're 91 to 93. On ATVs, on motorcycles, what the GNCC requires when you sign your documentation, when you come in, is that you will run a silencer, a spark arrester, so it serves two purposes. Not only does it quiet the exhaust down, but it also serves as a spark arrester, which means it keeps anything from backfiring out of the exhaust, meaning flames, which obviously helps when we're trying to prevent forest fires. But the easy way to explain it is this. If you get on any website and you were to look up, I'm going to give you a specific model just to give you an idea. If you were to look up a 2018 Yamaha YFZ 450, that's an ATV, and you were to get on FMF's website, which is one of the main exhaust uh, producers, they're going to say that when their quiet core is in, their silencer, their spark arrestor, however you want to call it, it's not going to be but about the same exact loudness as a lawnmower. Now, the way that we're strategizing to do this is we're going to start the races as far away from local homes as we can. So what I mean by that is once you drive into the property, one, you all would be amazed. Ron has actually been to the events before. Uh, that's how this all started was Ron played water boy for my dad when he was racing. And when you go to events, the start is obviously there's going to be noise. There's 15, 12, 10 people on a row. And then as the flag drops, you hear a, a hum, it's a loud hum. That pretty much dissipates over the course of about 20 minutes because everyone gets spread out through the woods and the trees do their job of protecting the sound. So the one thing that we're going to put into place is every house within a mile and a half of the, I'm going to go ahead and put it on Google Earth and draw us a, a wagon wheel, every home within a mile and a half, we're going to approach them, let them know that we are doing the event, and also offer them free tickets if they want to come to the event. Uh, just because, once again, we want to make sure that there's no ill will with anyone surrounding the area. But the suppressors, the, the whatever you want to call them, there's four or five names for them, but the exhaust people are required to use silencers in them. They sign that documentation, and before races, there is a pit, and when I say pit, it's a small building that you drive your machine through. They look and make sure you have a tether cord. So a tether cord is, say for example, I'm riding, and something happens, I jump off the machine. The tether cord then, if anyone's familiar with it, shuts the machine off so that the machine doesn't keep rolling. That's one, and two is that they want us to have silencers. So that's the easiest way to describe the sound. So it will be very, very contained, and honestly, with the Green River Gun Club being down the road, with guns being 135 decibels, I don't think you'll have any sound problems at all. So, any others? Uh, yeah, so the only other questions I had, I don't know if that, this is a question for you or for Jeff, um, is just related to talking about our landfill cap and um, its safety in terms of environmental, keeping all that contained, and safety of the participants who might possibly wander onto it. So can you talk a little bit about what a landfill cap is and how it's keeping um, those contaminants um, <coughs> sealed and if there's any danger at all for any of those things to be? Uh, to be honest, we, we kind of wore Psy out on that a couple <laughs> days ago. Did. Uh, Matt and I, we kind of tag teamed him. Uh, but basically, there's a roughly 30 acres of landfill kind of in the middle of this property. It's on your map. That landfill has a heavy liner two feet below the soil, the surface of the soil. There is two feet of soil as, as well as vegetation on top of that. There are what they, he calls candy cane vents that vent any gases that are below the liner or the membrane that, that's two feet down. Those vents are a couple of feet below the liner that release any gases to kind of help that thing breathe. And so uh, that was our main concern is that, that they are well aware of that. Uh, we didn't want any, any traffic really on, if it got muddy, any wheels spinning on top of that landfill. Matt really hammered on that, that you know, if it was muddy that day, you can't get up on top of that landfill and spin your tires because you're soon to, get to meet up with that, that liner, and we spent a lot of money on that liner. And so uh, Cy has assured us that most of the activity will be around the landfill area, and the only thing that may happen on top of there is um, some, some, some foot traffic. So uh, is that 
yes. it might be a good 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 place to go watch the race because it's about it's a couple about of feet it's like a plateau area mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit higher than the rest of the the land of the property and so it might be a good viewing point for some people to watch parts of the races from but uh, there will not be any activity as far as the race goes on top of that landfill area that's correct and just to clarify that um, we do hope that people take foot traffic up on top of there just to be able to see the race because if you were actually so earlier I, I referenced where we will line flags up where people pull in once you pass that section where they pay of course we will have parking in the fields to the left once you reach the landfill area for those of you that have never been out there it's actually a pretty large slope as in a normal vehicle would never climb it a jeep in four-wheel drive might climb it but it would be off cambered and there's a ditch that runs alongside of it too so there there's almost no chance that any vehicle could get there, but what we're going to do is prohibit them from doing that. And even if an ATV or motorcycle were to do that, so we're clear, when an ATV gets stuck, for example, so I'm, I'm a numbers person, so I'll explain it. When an ATV gets stuck and the rear end digs down and they're spinning tires, the skid plate of the ATV will sit on the ground and they can sit there and spin all they want to. It's not going to get any deeper. That's only a 4.5 to 5 inch ground clearance. So at the very worst, you might see seven or eight inches that would dissipate. Once again, we are not going to let them up there. In the case that someone wanted to be a rebel and a nomad and go for it, one, they would be thrown out of the event because we're going to be writing that up with GNCC. But two, it would never reach two foot anyway. The only way that could ever happen is if you had a, a truck, in reality, a truck with 40-inch tires that buried itself down to the frame. That's the only way you could ever actually get that deep. So once again, we're going to make sure that everything is taken care of properly. Uh, the, the easiest way to say all this is we are going to avoid that top section because there's no reason for us to be up there anyway because there's plenty of field section and as i mentioned earlier we're working on acquiring an additional 900 acres around the property so i've actually been in contact with those landowners today just pending and letting them know that if we close a deal with the city we want to make sure that we could use your property to cut you a six foot trail use it for a weekend and then we'll mend the trail and you have yourself a walking trail when it's over so that's the easiest way to explain that so is there anything else i can answer for any of you just have a couple of clarifying questions based yeah. on sort of what you shared. So how far down are the tops of the vents then? Because you said that's higher than the liner. The vents are like this, mm -hmm. two feet above the surface. And they're turned down so water can't get down in them. So they would vent out. But they're also, around, uh, Matt says they're at least two feet or more, probably even said further, typically three feet maybe three to four feet below the surface below the liner so they're roughly six to seven feet long but only maybe two feet of them stick out on top uh, above the surface they're, they're visible so that's another reason they wouldn't want to be up there because there's several of them up there and they're yes every, and, and so even where they're apart. showing to clarify even where they're showing we plan on either putting hay bales or barrels or something beside all of the you can call them candy canes that's what that's what they look like as they stick out of the ground but as matt has already said they're passive as in they're really not there's nothing really active there anymore this the i mean the landfill has been closed for nearly four decades now so they obviously recapped it in the early 90s um, but once again you know this two foot you have your two feet of topsoil where well, you have your topsoil you have two feet of dirt and then on top of that you have your liner underneath that and to my understanding I may be incorrect, but to my understanding, there was also, and this is just what I read, there is also a layer below that liner of just dirt. Now, it may not be qualified to be recognized as worthy of, of two feet, but once again, we will stay away from there, and, and it, would take, it would take a miracle for somebody to ever get down to that topsoil or to that tarp area. So just as an example of, you know, Worst case scenario. So say someone does go rogue and goes up there with an ATV or whatever, and they uh, crash into one of our vents and knocks it over and it rips the lining. Is it written in the lease what happens next? They're going to fix it. They're going to fix it. In the lease. And, and is there any uh, environmental damage in terms of release gases that might do unintended damage at that point? No. I've checked on that. I've, you've checked on that as well, correct? Yes, and even just so we're clear as well, and Matt could clarify this, Matt Powell could. But Matt is completely comfortable with this, yeah. this agreement. And Matt is obviously the overseer of the property, to my knowledge, correct? Right. And even if, and once again, even if one of the, we'll call them candy canes for the record, if one of the candy canes were hit, it's a plastic tube that simply sticks in the ground and allows 
basically allows gases to seep to it. Matt can explain it from a science standpoint that I do not understand, but to my knowledge, it's not a big deal because Matt gave the thumbs up and he was comfortable. So if Matt's comfortable, I'm comfortable. This, this landfill is completely different than the Butler County landfill. We, we have no lease shake going on with this landfill. It's so old, it's been capped for so long. There is no seeping going on. It's just, it's ba basically like pasture land. It's ineffective and is what it so, is. But we, we have to, we had to do the venting uh, per, it was mandated that we did it and we did it. So, uh, but it's, it's nothing like the lease shake deal. We have Butler County, it's a very inactive site. And it's been that way for a long time. So we're, we just did the vents because we were told to do so for long-term maintenance. I just had one more question and that's in follow-up to Ron. You're, um, I'm glad to hear that we have a committee sort of working through the logistics. And obviously, of course, probably fresh in everyone's mind is the Beach Bend uh, traffic situation. So was this committee, did they provide the logistics ahead of time and just weren't prepared for that? Or was this formed in result of kind of the issues that happened around the Beach Bend event? Uh, there's been a committee that's been ongoing that's coordinated traffic activities for different events. So there was a smaller subcommittee that was ongoing doing that. What you had with, I mean, not that this relates to that really, but since the question was asked, what you had with the LS Fest situation was you had, I think, a 30% growth in attendance one year followed by a 50% growth in attendance the next year. So even though law enforcement and others did a great job preparing for it, you had so much growth of people coming that it became more of a traffic problem. So we got with the Convention of Visitors Bureau, expanded the nature of the committee, included even engineering folks from the city, the county, the state, and so we've got a much broader committee looking at all events. Because what we all want to do is make sure that the people that come have such a great time that they want to come back and stay longer and spend more money. And so obviously protecting public safety, job one, but while they're here, how do we make sure they have a good time, come back, spend money, create jobs to support quality of life in our community? And my understanding is this, in terms of the road options here for egress and, and get, get into the property, that there's more options that we don't have on Beach Bend in terms of being able to direct traffic in ways that are not going to just bottleneck us like it did in the other Apples situation. and oranges. I mean, there's a number of different constraints on the Beach Bend situation mm -hmm. than this. I mean, Thank you. Yes, ma'am. To clarify one last item that Ron just spoke on, once again, on the entry, we will have one road used as an entry. We will have one road used as an exit. Um, obviously, there's going to be some people that don't want to tend to that. That's perfectly fine because it is a two-lane road in and out. I've been in there in a 24-foot long dually truck, and I've met cars on the road, and it's not a big deal. So, once again, we will do our best. We're going to work with anybody we have to to make sure because just for our ease of mind, too, I'm going to be racing that weekend. I mean, I'm running for a national champion's points. So I don't want to be focused on the road because we're going to do our work up front. And that's, once again, one of the main things that we want to do. I want to clarify that so many times is we want to work with the city. We don't want to do this like many things I'm sure you all have heard stories of, maybe even had happen in this region where people go and develop something like this and it shuts down a couple of years later or five or ten years later because they're trying to go against the grain and do their own thing. I understand that doesn't work. I understand there's a political side that has to be covered. And I understand, especially meeting and knowing Janet now and understanding what she has to go through just to prepare for this event, to prepare all the businesses. We want to do this properly. So I'm, I'm going to be more teachable than you can ever imagine. I like to think I know a little bit about life, but I don't know much when it comes to dealing with all the ordinances and dealing with all the things within the city, which is why we sought the help that we did and we will continue to. Mm -hmm. Any anything to minimize the impact on the neighborhood would be correct. And and I was going to ask that as well. Do, do, does anyone have any suggestions for what we can do for the neighbors besides obviously approaching them, letting them know what we're going to do, offer them free opportunity to come to the event? Uh, obviously, they hear the Green River Gun Club every single day of the year. They're open 365 days a year. You can walk on the property and hear a lot of that going on. So anything that any suggestions that any of you may have, we are 100% open and willing to to make those effective. I think there, the is, there is a neighbor right there. Right. And a lady that would like to speak when we get finished with our questions. I think getting finished. them in and out of their neighborhood, okay. you know, but she, she can address that. Uh, for me, it would be, what am I going to do when I leave here? 
right. like I need to go to church or I need to go to whatever right. um, Saturday at three o'clock in the afternoon how do I get out of my neighborhood right. efficiently oh, and also just to give you an idea most people are going to show up Saturday afternoon or Saturday or sorry Friday afternoon throughout the day, people will be pulling in. Saturday morning, the races start at 8 a.m., so most of your traffic will be done by the time the sun is coming up, just to be very clear how that works. Um, obviously, the pro races are in the afternoon. Uh, there will be a lot of people that race on Saturday, and they're gone. There will be a lot of people that race on Sunday, and they don't show up until Sunday. So it's not like there's going to be X amount of people. The maximum amount of people will never be there all at the same time because people will continuously go. And I know that may sound like a bad thing, but when there's single vehicles leaving, it's not like we're going to have lines and lines. It's not like LS Fest. I, I went to LS Fest. I'm a big LS Fest fan. I sat in the traffic. I, I remember what it was like. Of course, it wasn't a big deal to me. I understood that that was part of the event. And then immediately after, I remember Ron speaking on growing that aspect of being able to then grow the event further. So we're open to anything. Once again, we're going to do our very best, but we also want the help of anybody that's willing to get involved. Yeah. Finish. Yes. Emma, I think you had some comments for us. Would you like to speak? You're okay. Yeah. Come up to the microphone so we can hear you. <laughs> um, I have lived on Glen Lily Road. Approximately. Give us your name and address so we can put that in room. Uh, my address is 2472 Glen Lily Road. So I'm going to be about halfway from where if you come off Veterans and turn on Glen Lily between that and the point of this event. And your name too, please. Patricia Gary, G A R Y. Um, my concern is not the event. I love car things. I always have when. Uh, I met my husband, my future mother-in-law told me, said, you know what his first word was? It was not mama or daddy, mother <laughs> or father. It was car. So when um, I knew of him, he had a 58 Corvette and he had a 1930 Model A Ford Roadster. Uh, he would drag the Roadster and he would pull it with the Corvette with the tow bar. You can imagine how funny this was. Um, I assisted him sometimes till he kept running out of gas going down the drag strip. Since then, once um, all the children were involved and so forth, we used Model A that was a, considered a street rod, which is modified to drive to today's standards, and go to Minneapolis, St. Paul, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, Muscle Shoals, Alabama. You've not traveled till you've traveled in a Model A going all the way to Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, we also were lucky enough that a Corvette came into our life we thought was a 54, and when he got it home and we read the number, it was a 55. That's the second rarest cor production Corvette made. Uh, so we traveled in it all over this part of the United States. We uh, started a street rod club for fellow participants like us. Uh, we were ecstatic when we heard that the Corvette plant might possibly come here. I've worked with them doing uh, um, T-shirts from all over the United States, all over the world. That was quite a chore. Uh, enjoyed it. We've got uh, Corvettes Limited here that I'm a founding member of. Uh, when we heard the museum was coming, oh my goodness. Uh, they were talking about doing it in Australia. They were talking about doing it in Germany and whatever, and I'm going, but we have the Corvette plant here. So uh, our club worked really hard and worked with the people involved. And uh, we're so glad that we have both of those. I love car events. My step-grandson was an ATV rider champion. So I know what this pertains to. I know the noise, I know the hoopla, until he was severely injured with a neck injury that came this close to paralyzing him. Um, so I'm very familiar with that. My problem is, not the event. I'm excited about this event, just not where it is because I live on Glen Lily Road and it is very narrow. There's broken off spots on this road in front of my house. When I call either the state police or sheriff department when I hear of a wreck down there by the sound and they'll say, Miss Gary, you have another wreck in front of your house. And I said, yes, I do. Is anybody hurt? Do you need an ambulance? But, of course, they send the fire trucks and the police. Um, 
my concern is there is no shoulder on either side of the road in that area as there are no shoulders on the road in a lot of places going from veterans to the location of this show. How, I mean, I, every day when I have to pull out of my driveway, I roll my windows down, I shut the air or heat off, whichever, no radio, and I sit and listen going, I don't think I hear a car and I have to gun it to get out in my road and sometimes look up and there'll be one right on my back bumper and your heart does this. But anyway, it's not the event. It's the location of, and the people that live along this area. You're talking about possibly bringing in large trucks. There'll be vendors coming in, not counting um, the campers and so forth. I don't know that the pavement is gonna hold up this. If they don't fix it in front of my house where <laughs> water comes off, I live on a hill in the woods and water comes off that and uh, it is washing out under the road. So there could be major problems with using Glen Willie Road. And that's, that's my, my big complaint. There's straight stretches and these people that are unfamiliar with Glen Lily, all at once you top a hill and there's a curve right there and you don't know it. And there'll be lots of wrecks. There'll be lots of accidents. That's a big concern for me. I hate to see people hurt. I like to see people enjoy events like this. But my concerns are the people that live along Glen Lily Road. That's about Thank all you, Ms. I've Gary. got we'll, to say. We'll make Glen Lily is a state highway, and we'll make sure that the it is district a state engineer it is, a state is aware highway. of those concerns and knowing that this is coming, and see if there's any thing it can do to help make those make that road as safe as possible, especially with signage and uh, so forth. I live with a curve on the left side, and I live with this hill and curve coming from the right side, as do a lot of people along there. But again, you could run into straight stretches, and then all at once, you run into that situation. Ms. That Ms. That's why yeah. I'm concerned. Ms. Gary, you're on the inside of Natcher Parkway, right? Is that what you said? Before um, you get to Natcher? Um, when you you're on come, the city side of Natcher? I'm on the county side of Natcher. Okay. I'm between... Um, Do you cross under the Natcher or over the Natcher to get to your house? No, I'm... Bef um, uh, just before Natcher Parkway before, okay. on the right, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course there's a straight stretch in that section uh, going up on across the bridge of Natcher or what in the paper stated I-65, which is Natcher Parkway. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my major concern. Okay. Uh, Questions? <laughs> Well, I would just like to hear, Mr. Sy. Uh, I'm sure you all have, this, have the same concerns about wanting to keep your participants safe and um, have looked at the roadway. So just wondering if that's one of the requirements that the CUP has in terms of uh, this construction of a road, if it can handle um, this sort of event. So just wanting to hear from you about your response to her question would be great. Have it tomorrow when you get out of here. <laughs> yes, I do. I agree. I encourage you to drive it. Uh, once again, just as the mayor stated, anything, it is a state highway, anything that can be done with that, once again, we seek guidance for that. I do want to say, obviously, I, I pray and I speak it into existence that there won't be wrecks. There won't be accidents. We, we, don't, we don't see that. Uh, in other GNCC events, you don't see that. Keep in mind, most rigs, obviously, are longer. People don't have the opportunity to be going very fast when you're pulling a trailer through country roads. Most of these people, you have to remember, they tour from Maine to Florida to Indiana to Oklahoma. They drive all over the country. They're very well aware, believe it or not, Glen Lily Road is one of the better entry roads that this series ever sees. So once again, I just want to pertain back to what the mayor has said. Anything that we can seek guidance-wise, we'll make sure that we do that. I do once again encourage you to do what she says and drive the road tomorrow and see what you feel about it. I had uh, heard that it, normally this is done in, in more rural areas, and so um, that it does sound like the folks who come are used to driving country roads, which I think is important to know. You kind of learn as you experience driving on those roads a lot how you have to drive those differently to stay safe. So um, I'm aware of, of sort of that dynamic. Um, yes, there's a race that goes on in West Virginia that is at the top of a mountain, 
and I literally mean at the top of a mountain. So these people are more than qualified, very aware. Obviously, we don't want any accidents. I pray there aren't any accidents. There's always an opportunity for that to happen. But once again, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that it is taken care of properly. And then it's my understanding that that's something that the committee will also address is looking at the engineering. And is there opportunity for uh, events like this to bring about improvements that may need to be made that she had brought up? Is that something that this? Okay. Anyone else? Anything else? Any other comments or questions? Roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Thank you. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2019-54. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning tracts of land containing three acres from AG Agriculture to HB Highway Business in RM4 Multifamily Residential, located at 0 and 721 Plano Road, presently owned by Stan Dar with Ben Hansborough as the applicant. I moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. This is a second reading of a unanimous recommendation from the Planning Commission. There's any other, any further comment or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2019-55. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning attractive land containing 0.14 acre from GB General Business to CB Central Business, located at 875 Broadway Avenue, presently owned by Michael Poston with Mike Cornelius as the applicant. I move. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Denning. Again, a second reading of a unanimous recommendation from Planning and Zoning. Are there any further comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Second reading of Ordinance BG 2019-56. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning tracts of land containing 0.38 acre from GB General Business to RM4 Multifamily Residential, located at 1224 and 1228 Indianola Street, presently owned by Choice Rental Properties, LLC. I move. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. It's a nearly unanimous recommendation from Planning and Zoning, 11 to 1. Is there any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Denning? Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, that's the last item on our agenda. Uh, I don't see any members of the public here, so we'll close the meeting at the next scheduled meeting for January 21st, 2020. Thank you for tuning in.